So um, for those of you who are here this morning for the GeoPit Talks, uh, just to let you know, I don't have the voice that uh, Jay McKelvey has, and I certainly don't have the guitar skills that Jay McKelvey has, but I will be speaking on something I am passionate about, and that is uh, geotechnical forensics building your toolbox. So what do I mean by toolbox? Well, if we think about it in a toolbox in a garage, uh, we may have a wrench, we may have a screwdriver, we may have a hammer, uh, all these different tools that we need to do whatever we need to do. How about a geotechnical toolbox? Okay, we may have using boring CPTs, geophysical surveys, found, doing, be able to do foundation design, uh, slope stability analysis as an example, finite element analysis. These are all tools that we use as geotechnical engineers. And for the most part, we're pretty comfortable with using those tools, we're pretty uh, proficient at that. But oftentimes, uh, a forensic analysis and investigation requires tools outside of our conventional toolbox and what we're comfortable with. So let's go over just some broad categories of what, at least in my opinion, a forensic toolbox includes for geotechnical engineering. One would be collection of historical data. That could be finding old board, uh, geotechnical reports. Um, it could be collecting historical era photographs, topographic data, what, you name it. Field investigations, right? So it could be borings, could be geophysical surveys, could be field monitoring. Our geotechnical analysis and presentation of the results. And this one seems like such a simple item but we're doing all this work, all this analysis, and if we're not distilling it in a way where, our, where the audience can understand these complex ideas, then we're not doing our job the right way. And our, our, the audience could be a jury or a judge or it could be a city official. Now, if we just say for a moment that we take our uh, forensic tools and we make them into 10, say our toolbox has 10 tools available to us, I'm gonna go through a few examples and scenarios that, uh, that we can use as part of a forensic investigation. So let's say an emergency landslide repair. Okay, if we have 10 tools available, we're not gonna be using all 10 for this type of investigation. So here, say we use seven of the 10, and that could include topographic surveying, could include um, you know, inclinometers for instrumentation and monitoring could include collecting uh, topographic data from before the landslide, right? Here's another example. Say that there's uh, potential building damage due to a deep excavation adjacent to it. Again, we're not gonna be using all 10, we're gonna, but we're gonna be using different types of tools than what we'd use for the landslide repair. So that may involve uh, different types of instrumentation and monitoring. So for a deep excavation, the types of ground movements are in the order of inches or millimeters. Whereas if we look at the landslide, those uh, ground movements are in the order of feet or meters. So we're obviously using different types of tools. We're using um, different methodologies to approach uh, the ground movements and resulting damage. Let's look at another example. Let's say there's a tunneling project and there's resulting sinkholes from that tunneling work. Uh, as, as Nick uh, pointed out in terms of large data AI, there's um, oftentimes TBMs can produce millions or tens of millions of data points. It's a tool and a skill to actually be able to process through that data and understand it uh, for our investigation, right? So these are different types of tools that are being used for each of these projects and say that there's a residential tract development and there's expansive soil damage. Okay, there's a different types of tools as well. We're dealing with large areas. We're dealing with uh, potentially surveying uh, the floor slabs and seeing the deformation uh, as a result of the, um, of the expansive soil movement. So each of these, let's look at this, each of these different scenarios requires a different set of skills and all of them have skills that are outside of our normal toolbox. So let's look at historical data um, because a lot of these things are underutilized and I wanna bring those to the forefront. So for example, aerial photographs. Okay, why, why am I bringing up aerial photographs? It's such, such a simple idea, but 
we see so often that that information is not collected and is being left and underutilized. So there's aerial photographs from all over the country from the early 1900s through here. And we may be looking at those aerial photographs over the course of decades or even over the course of months and seeing the changes between those photographs and collecting that information and using it as one of the tools as part of our investigation. Okay, topographic geologic maps, past geotechnical reports, public building records, how the infrastructure was constructed. These are all important things. I wanna highlight digital elevation data just as an example. I think we're, um, if we think about that first scenario, which was the landslide, okay, we can collect the topographic data after the landslide occurred. But what about before the landslide occurred? That information is very important for us to perform our slope stability back analysis, et cetera. And USGS has great LIDAR data publicly available that we can use to recreate the topography before the landslide. But if we think about that second scenario, say a deep excavation resulting in building movement, that LIDAR data doesn't have enough precision for us to do our analysis. And we may need to move to something more robust, like say INSAR data, uh, and other types of uh, more precise data. So field investigation, okay, field mapping, surveying, remote sensing. I think we're all familiar with drone, uh, drone surveys and all that, but having that in-house as a tool instead of having to subcontract it out. Let me give you an example. In Southern California, I'm dealing with a, uh, with a landslide that crossed three properties and that landslide occurred a year ago. So we performed a drone survey, we collected our information, we got high quality uh, images that saw the ground cracks and, and all that. Now, as you may know, Southern California and all of California had an extremely heavy rainy winter. So January of this year, there was another generation of movement both in the previous slide area and additional slide area. We dispatched out right away, performed another survey, and found that snapshot in time. February, there was another generation of movement. So we've, we were able to survey that again. And the value of having that in your own toolbox is that we have control of the data. We have the same staff collecting data every single time. We're not relying on different subcontractors and their availability and all that. We're able to do it in-house and at a moment's notice. Um, subsurface exploration, we all know about that. So forensic analysis, okay, we have our conventional geotechnical tools that we know and love, our foundation analysis, our settlement calculations, our finite element, we have all that. But there's a couple other things that I just wanna highlight that are beyond that, that are oftentimes underutilized. One is utilizing geospatial, geospatial data. Um, so that's taking historical data and compiling it with, uh, with, field, with data that we collect from the field. So this is an example, it's a warehouse in Southern California. We were called out because there's a lot of distress to the building, there's differential foundation settlement. And as you can see here, there, you know, the, the slab was poured to slope, right? But you can see that on the upper part of the, of the image, the contour lines are relatively consistent, right? But on the bottom, there's basically a trough and there's like seven, we found a seven to eight inch uh, differential foundation settlement across that area. And okay, so what we did is we looked at, uh, before we did any subsurface exploration, we looked at uh, historical uh, topographic maps, geologic maps, and they did not indicate any features in that area. But what we did is we overlaid a, an aerial photograph from the early 1900s, and there's a stream running right through that trough, okay? So that helped in, uh, in our selection of uh, subsurface exploration methods, and, uh, and helped our investigation. Now here's another example. This is Northern California, and this is not a conventional tool that I'm gonna talk about, con conventional geotechnical tool at all. This is a site in Northern California. There was immense flooding and damage of this area, and we found rainfall stations. And those rainfall stations showed between 1.5 and four inches of rainfall over that 24 hour period. Now the amount of damage was consistent with a much higher level of rainfall. So we, we, there's no sites closer to that, no rainfall stations. So what we did is we co uh, collected the radar data for rain cloud density, and there's a way to estimate based on the cloud density the amount of precipitation. So we did that and we found it was very interesting. The rainfall stations 
the radar data at the rainfall stations were very, very close to the measured values. And what was interesting was you see the yellow area around the site. That's a dense uh, storm cell that passed over the site that missed the nearby rain stations. And we were able to utilize information, and this estimated about seven to eight inches of rainfall. So that explained the heavy amount of damage that occurred. So last thing I'm gonna cover is just presentation of the results. As I mentioned, it's such a simple thing to say, but when we're dealing with these complex problems, performing our intense analysis and going through the grinding out the results and finding our conclusions, if we can't distill that information for our audience, then we're not doing our job and we're not being effective. And again, our audience could be a jury who not only they have no technical knowledge, but they also sometimes have no interest, <laughs> right? So knowing our audience and preparing our results so they can be understood is a really important part of forensic engineering. And so if I were to leave with a couple final words, one is that to be aware of the tools available outside of our conventional toolbox. We know what our toolbox is. We're, we know our comfort zone but it's expanding outside of that. And this of course applies beyond forensics, right? But knowing what's outside of our toolbox. The other thing is taking those things that are outside of our toolbox and doing our best to add those to our toolbox and increase our abilities so we can do the best job that we can. Thank you.